This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, so the idea today is to hear about uh, bioswales infiltration practices and what we've done on Cornell campus, sh uh, show you how we did it, what's, uh, uh, what but the- But to be clear, the focus is really about soil and plants. We're not trying to give you engineering practices or do, you know, runoff calcs. Um, so the, the lecture really has a particular focus. And so we'll spend some time in here uh, seeing those practices and seeing what we've done and how we did it. And then we'll go outside, uh, hope the weather holds off, and we'll the see here uh, before Thorne shows up, and we'll see the, uh, the two bioswales we were specifically talking about. Today. Because they're really impressive. And it's one thing to talk about them, it's something else to see the evolution of built form and after a year, two years, three years, um, what your expectations might be. If you do them correctly, if you do them poorly, yeah. we know what those look like. No, we don't want to see those. No, okay, sure. okay. So uh, ecosystem services or ecosystem benefits, uh, we rely on the landscape to provide many of these and you've heard about this term ecosystem services or benefits. And they relate to stormwater reduction, air and water, water quality improvement, energy conservation, carbon sequestration, keeping carbon in the plants, urban heat uh, island mitigation, and uh, habitat for pollinators and animals. And so we're going to specifically look at the stormwater reduction uh, aspect of ecosystem services, but they do have other aspects in terms of some of these other services that we get. And uh, what is stormwater? Uh, rain or snow melt that does not directly infiltrate the soil. Impervious service in the U.S. is estimated to be 43,000 square miles and about 400 square miles is added each year and that paved surfaces is what prevents water from infiltrating in the ground. Compacted soils also, which is very ubiquitous in urban areas, reduce water infiltration and uh, all this increases the uh, stormwater tax, taxes the capacity of stormwater and, and combined stormwater sewage treatment plants. So this is important that many cities are looking at this issue and uh, people are being asked to produce these. So we thought what better way to have this on the Cornell campus, teach our students and teach folks who come to hear about it, like you. Uh, so 81% of the US population is urban and in New York State, 88% of the population lives in urban areas. Just to say that in urban areas, you have lots of impervious surfaces, roads, buildings, cars, sidewalks, parking lots, and that's where most of these impacts will be felt and how we can mitigate them. Um, and as we see what's happening down in North Carolina, South Carolina, in terms of all the flooding, that's not to say that that's not gonna be you know, done away with by using infiltration devices, but there's a lot more of this happening in the urban areas where infiltration is very poor. So stormwater issues, uh, these are why we don't want stormwater uh, uh, not to go into the ground. It's sedimentation and trash, stream bank, stream bank erosion, a lot of excess nutrient, organic and hydrocarbon pollution from parking lots, from other uh, places that are extruding these things, bacterial contamination, pesticide poisoning, road salt contamination, all of these things uh, are on the impervious surfaces and get washed into our streams, our rivers, and cause pollution. There's quite a bit online today about the uh, contamination caused by stormwater and flooding relative to the hurricane. So while that's an extreme case, it happens in different conditions, sometimes related to agriculture, where we're dealing with uh, manures, and other uh, material that flows off as a part of stormwater events. So it behooves us to get the water back in the ground and not let it flow into our waterways. And of course, this is not too far from here. A few years ago, <laughs> this is Route, 81. Route 81 going down to Binghamton. I mean, we had huge flooding uh, involved in that. Right in the southern tier was a tremendous amount of flooding and 
a lot, you know, doing to deer and dealing with uh, impervious surfaces. So infiltration practices, bioswales, there are lots of different infiltration practices. Bioswales are a stormwater runoff conveyance, an infiltration system uh, that slows, directs, cleans, and helps infiltrate water runoff. And a plant's assist in stormwater infiltration and provide ecological value, such as creating habitat and reducing urban heat island effects. So plants yeah, are often, part of this. Yeah, I think oftentimes we don't think about all these benefits. We're so focused on stormwater that we're not looking at things like habitat generation. Right. So uh, on Cornell University, we're not going to, this is a, a mock-up of a sustainability trail which we built and are about to launch on the Cornell campus where we uh, basically call out different practices which we've done all in orange here that deal with ecosystem benefits services. And we today are going to be looking at this quarter mile long uh, bioswale and these three linked bioswales there too. Not all of these are bioswales, but there's some ecological practice that we'd like to help people learn about. So we're looking at the Tower Road bioswale. And if you go to one of these studies, a QR code, you can you link to a website, find out more about it. And uh, we think this would be a useful thing for people just instead of just walking by a landscape, they'll say, well, this is actually working landscape. It's a functional landscape as well as being beautiful. And it tells a story. And that's a black locust post, just in FYI. Sustainable, non-rotting. OK, so this is our site, the uh, Tower Road Bioswale site. Prior to building the Bioswale, it was a place where there was a, a nose-in parking for, I don't know, 50 years or more. Yeah, there was you know, over 200 cars. Uh, and it was serendipitous. It was never designed. People started parking, and then we had turf creek. Right. So very compacted. You can see there's no the stormwater just sits, sits there or goes into storm drains, and there's no infiltration at all. This was the site before we started to work on it. And so the idea is that we, this is a pretty complex little area here. We have our sidewalk a curb, we have an open curb uh, pitch, so getting stormwater off of the road into this designed soil and aggregate sub-base. It's important to think when you're dealing with perviousness, it's not just getting water to soil. The soil has to be infiltrate fast, and you have to have a reservoir to hold that. So the soil is designed to be a sandy loam with high organic matter, so it's, it's kind of a, a it holds water, but it also drains water quite fast. And it's only about 18 inches in our particular uh, site. And then uh, geotextile and then uh, open aggregate, number two stone typically uh, would be anywhere from 12 to 24 inches. And this was done uh, sort of on a shoestring at Cornell, but it still works pretty well. So that's the idea. It could be much deeper than that uh, and hold more water. Truly a schematic. Right. So, but on top of Cornell being what it is, they on top uh, on top of the aggregate, uh, they thought they'd have a perf pipe in case there was Don't too much water. Suspenders. And in case we had Hurricane Florence come right here, uh, so that there would be extra, a little bit of slope, and any excess water we pull, pulled into a storm drain. We argued against this, but that's what happened. And on top of this, there was a geotextile, and then the soil was added on top of that. So aggregate subbase you know, provides a lot of storage capacity. That's important to have that reservoir under your uh, soil, open graded clean, durable one to two inch. Gives you porosity about 35 to 40% of pore space that holds water. And the depth of the aggregate can be varied to provide more storage volume. You know, we talk about it used to be that the 20, uh, the 100 year storm was six inches in one uh, day, 24 hours, uh, six inches of rain. Of course, storm water can be water that's moving by a slope as well, but six inches of uh, rain in 24 hours is quite significant. I think that's not our 100 year storm anymore, but uh, it's still up there. And so can, you can actually store a lot of water in this. Um, 
And a nominal depth of at least 12 inches is what we would recommend, although probably 24 would be better. And the point is you're looking not just for storage, but infiltration eventually. Right, and so under, under the aggregate, you'd want the water to slowly go into the ground as well. So you get your planting soil, your storage, and then eventually down into the ground. So 12 inches of gravel, 35% porosity gives you at 4.2 inches of water stored. And the deeper you make it, you get up to 6.3 with 18 inches of aggregate. So you really have a capacity to store water uh, where you're not gonna get flooding uh, happening. So after we have our, our you know, gravel and our uh, perf pipe, and then we had our geotech, we put a uh, design soil, meaning that was blended of sand, loam, and uh, compost to have a pretty sandy uh, loam mix with about 8% uh, organic matter, which is pretty high, and that's by dry weight. So we are trying to balance out the infiltration and the support of plant growth. This is only five feet wide, okay? So it's, and it's got to deal with, as we'll see, salt and a lot of other issues in terms of its narrowness. So in 2014, with my class, um, we planted it in the uh, autumn of the 14. You can see the drop curves here where the water is coming off the road into the uh, bioswale and basically filling up that area. And we're not going to talk about it today, but there are monitoring wells as a part of this. So we can actually look at things like water temperature and you know, issues of salinity. And so quality, right. So there's- So it's educational. Yeah, the other thing is that we expect that the water going in here will be cleansed by the microorganisms in the soil and be filtered by the organic matter and the gravel itself. So again, this is a quarter mile long. We did this all in one afternoon. Thank God we had volunteers. We had volunteers, about 40 students, never, never. Right, that's right. So again, this is the idea, water coming off the road and through the drop curve into the planting area and then being stored and then eventually released to the ground. Again, plants are an important part of this. Just a quickly looking at what plants do in terms of stormwater. Uh, you've got precipitation and we got uh, runoff here, but about in a, in a canopy, whether it's a shrub or tree canopy, if it's a light rainfall, about 65% of that rain will be entrained or trapped by the leaves themselves and then evaporated back to the air. So you can actually, uh, and you know, when it's light rain, you wanna stay out of the rain, you go under a tree as long as it's not lightning. Um, and so you get through fall eventually, you get evapotranspiration from the ground through the tree, water being lost and used, and we get water going into the ground, infiltration, so that it's being stored there as well. So all these different uh, activities actually help, the plant helps in a great way to reduce storm water by using the water and trapping it and slowing it down. I mean, most of the plants you'll see today are all short forms. Well, so why use plants? Uh, the roots of plants actually provide infiltration channels. It's been shown that when you have roots in plants, water goes down much more quickly than if it's just straight soil. Uh, they take up pollutants like heavy metals, help to hold the soils together, uh, reducing erosion, slow runoff, reduce suspended solids, which is part of the cleansing, add aesthetic value, improve air quality. I'm just gonna look at that for one minute, aesthetic value. Because sometimes we choose plants, you know, for the sake of having plants, but for about 90% or 99% of the population, what they're really seeing is the plant selection, the plant quality. So it's got to look good too. I mean, there's nothing but. I mean, it's not just a question of uh, having uh, stormwater runoff reduction. It has to look beautiful. Uh, we do reduce the urban heat island, can sequester carbon, plants hold carbon, they bring in carbon dioxide, and increase biodiversity and creating wildlife habitats. So all these things, why we use plants in these installations. So here was right after planting in September of 2014. Uh, you see the infiltration basins, which are 
uh, cross up and down this whole quarter mile long stretch. Lots of different plants there. And then it snowed. Of course, we had winter 2015. And okay, you know, a little snow is an insulation. I didn't, wasn't worried about this. But as things got worse, I mean, this was also what it looked like the, the later. I mean, there are plants under there. Um, but it got really, you know, salt and encrusted. And it's a, it's a good moment to think about plant crush. You know, how do plants come back after they've had uh, big loads on top? Right. Because we, of course, we have, uh, we plow the roads and the sidewalks, and it goes right in there. But we thought about that before we planted, before we chose the plants. So this is what the light site looked like in the next year, early in the season, and then later in the season. So plants do come back. Uh, we do, when in the, after the snow melts and we can see the plants, we do cut them back, taking out you know, dead stems and salt uh, damaged stems, and we cut some things back just to the ground very simply so that they can reduce the size, because some of these things are a little bit taller than we'd like. This is what it looked like this morning when I walked walking by. Um, and so it's, it's about mature now. It's about, some of the plants are three, three and a half feet tall. And that's about where we want them. We didn't want to get something too tall where there'd be a issue. Every so often, Cornell facilities gets a complaint that the plants touched me. <laughs> and they have to cut them back. They touched me. Yeah, so. We want to non emotional. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is what it looks like this morning. And just want to make sure, just to go through the slide, but uh, these are we took salt readings in the soil over different times. This is anything over this pink line, which is 1.5 millimoles, uh, is toxic. So, we were having, after snow events, we were having quite a lot of toxicity in the soil in terms of salt. Cornell has a no ice policy, so you can imagine the flip side of that is a lot of crunchy salt. Right. And what's more interesting this year, we had a little different situation where, as you know, April was really cold. We had a lot of snow in April, which is more difficult for plants because they're starting to wake up, and now they get hit by a lot of snow and salt. And this is just along the sidewalk. Uh, we launched, wanted to look at where most of the salt coming from the road or from the sidewalk. So we looked at, tested si both sides, and the blue is the sidewalk side of the dye well. Much more salt coming it's off of the sidewalk. Into the, the so all that well. salt that was being put on the road from the sidewalk to prevent icing was going right into the bioswale. So let's stop one minute. And have you imagine what does this mean? So how do I respond to what we just said? We need two answers, otherwise we're not going on. That's it. Two hands. What do we do when we have so much salt? That looks like this. Or or what do we do in anticipation of having conditions like this? Yeah. Explore salt free or low salt alternatives for melting ice. Yeah, there's that's one thing. In fact, I brought that up to said to campus. I said just on this road because there's uh, calcium magnesium acetate, it's, a, uh, it's expensive, I said, but just on this stretch, can't we just do that? And they said, Well, if you buy it, Nina, we'll think about it. Uh, but in, in anticipation of knowing something like this, this is not unusual. What would you do when you design? Yeah. You get the salt past the root zone. Well, and uh, you know. That's going to happen. That's going to happen. It's going to happen when it rains. Least, yeah. But what else? I'm sorry. I need more than two answers. Yeah. <laughs> salt tolerant plants. Salt tolerant plants. And what is, what else about plants? Salt tolerance and something else <laughs> that is going to be critical. Well, you know the answer, but you're, they didn't give you I know. I'm the great carnage. I have the answer <laughs> to the question. Yeah, so I'm thinking about drug tolerance. But I'm yeah. also, I want to have a question about the graph, because I don't understand how to read, like, what six millions 
Yeah. Or, right. Yeah. So this Good is question. what's in that ground salt. Yeah. So you basically we take salt. Oh, there's background is down here below okay. one, below one. So above 1.5, it, it becomes toxic okay. to plants. Okay. And that's millimoles per centimeter square. So if we take soil and make a solution and we'll do it in our class. And we'll uh, drop a electrode in and we'll measure the salt. I mean, the other issue I would be concerned about is using evergreen plants where you're going to get foliar uh, dropped. Where so deciduous plants that don't have any leaves, basically the salt is going to. This goes back to. It's, it's going to be. Water below the root zone. Yeah, so we want good infiltration to move that salt away, but if we get late snowfalls like April, and that's the time when you get the most damage. Okay. So you can have salt tolerant plants, but are also evergreen and have all kinds of foliar uh, drop. Okay, so what plants are be best? Herbaceous plants require pruning to remove dead foliage. That's not something we want to work with. Woody plants require less pruning, re reducing the overall amount of maintenance. And use plants that tolerate wet and dry soils. This gets back to your point, Zach, that because these soils are so well drained, they have to, and this is the problem, people in basins like this will think about wet tolerance, but they won't think about when what happens rain. in August when there's not this August. 15 days, not this year, two years ago, when there's 15, 20 days of no rain with droughty soil. So these plants have to be ACDC. So it, it's true that most bioswales I see are planted with wet tolerant plants. Not thinking that there are times when it doesn't rain, it gets dry, these are well infiltrating soils. And you need to have a plant that's going to be drought tolerant as well, have the full range of ability to tolerate those two conditions. So uh, rain gardens, I'm just to make the point, we've seen these kind of depression rain garden areas, which take in water and hopefully infiltrate it into the ground. But there are a lot of herbaceous plants here. And the problem is during the winter time, oh. in the winter time, a lot of the plants just have no structure. You have to cut them back. It's just a, you know, the muddy hole. So we tend to use woody plants which have structure in the winter and look don't like collapse. something, don't collapse. So not something I would recommend. People do use herbaceous plants, they make a good summer show, but then the winter is a problem. And you better have maintenance. Because yeah. someone's got to cut them back. So best plants, both wet and dry tolerant. Uh, I'm going to see some of these. Salix rep and creeping willow. We love it. It's a great plant. It's a willow, so it does tolerate wet actually saturated conditions, but it's one of those willows that go actually very drought tolerant as well. So it's a great plant. It looks like grass. It's really... Uh, Rus copalina. This is a great uh, shining sumac. Uh, prairie flame is one cultivar we use, which is really dwarf. It's going to be shining sumac straight species can be quite tall. We wanted something about three feet max. And prairie flame is that. And you'll see that all along the coast. Jamaica Bay. Yeah. Or, I'll show um, you a picture of that. Bacchus, Hemelmifolia, Eastern Ground. So this is, you know, we sometimes try to mimic landscapes which have this kind of salty, drought, wet condition. And a lot of coastal areas have this. And Bacchus is one of these plants that's native from northern Florida up through Massachusetts and it's on blooming. the coast. It's blooming now. We're blooming right now. Yeah. Totally unexpected. Sorbus, Sorbifolia, False Aurelia, Morella. Hippophae, Rhamnoides, right? Hippophae is sea buckthorn. It's European. Uh, it's used as, if you buy the big ones, and they have fruit and it's used to make juice. But this is a male dwarf, yeah, no flower. Make sure you get a cultivar. Yeah. If you don't, you'll be really disappointed. Yeah. So this is a coastal in Europe, all up and down the uh, coast from Norway through to uh, uh, Central Europe on coastal areas. Um, Cephalanthus is our native button bush. It's a pretty big plant. And interestingly, it's thought of as we see it in wet, boggy areas in the landscape. But it also tolerates fairly droughty soil, too. Beautiful and, leaves. Dark and we are, you know, the, the straight species will be maybe can be up to like five or six feet tall. Um, Sugar Shack is a cultivar which has red fruit and is much more compact and it's dwarf. It's a cultivar world. Yes, it's a cultivar world. 
So let's look at, so Morella, we used to call this Myrica or Bayberry, is something we all know about, great in terms of uh, salt tolerance and wet and dry tolerance. So this is a plant that we know. And it's and in the evergreen around here. It stays till December with leaves on. Uh, so that's a, a great plant for this. And this is Rus copalina, um, shining sumac. Oh, when you see the fall color. Yeah. It's and like then uh, this is the creeping willow, Salix repens, beautiful yeah. plant. We look at Salix repens in the wind, it just sort of has a beautiful texture and feel to it. And this is uh, Rus copalina in fall color. This is where you see in the coastal area here, growing right in, right in coastal New York for that matter. It just it has this funny little bit of leaf on the rachis of the leaf. So it's kind of very unusual, but beautiful red, red fall color. A, as you can see, it's a colonizer. Yeah, spreads. So a lot of these plants are fighting it out on the bioswale that we expected that to happen. Fine. Some of them are gonna win, some are gonna lose. That's okay. Uh, Hippophae rhamnoides sprite. This is dwarf sea buckthorn, and it's a, a real beautiful gray leaf uh, plant that's done exceptionally, exceptionally salt tolerant. This you could actually water with salt water and it would be fine. It's really a seaside plant. Yeah. And this is Bacchus halimifolia, which is, it's a native on the coast, but you may not be so familiar with it. It comes in male and female plants, it's dioecious. So this is the male, it has all the stamens. And this is the female showing the, actually the seeds that are starting to form from, uh, from the pollination of the male. So, you get a bunch of backers and you'll get some male, some female. Hopefully it you get both. It does soak seed, yeah. And it's, this is except, it's just starting to bloom now. So very late to bloom. And this again is a seaside plant that thrives in droughty and wet, salty soil. Oh, yeah. So Cephalanthus buttonbush, uh, this is our native plant that you see uh, in wet areas here. It can be quite big. It's beautiful in terms of that, but it's a bit big it's for our. It's also a bit big for our five foot wide, you know, eighteen inches of soil. So we prefer to use uh, sugar shack, which has the red fruit, as you'll see here, much more compact and dwarf. So it's important to select the plants not just based on species, but on cultivar and and the the envelope of planting, the envelope of soil that you have to support these plants. So what we learned, best season to plant, we planted in the autumn. That wasn't a good idea. These plants had not got, you know, really established before the snow came. So we'd always do it in the spring, let them get established in the summer. And then, I mean, it's the same plants we, you know, are out there, but we found that they did better once we did spring planting and then they you might not have a choice, but if you do. Uh, plant for canopy closure. Canopy closure is when the plants knit together or touch each other. We don't want to have bare soil because bare soil As gives us weeds. Yeah. And so when you have canopy closure, much less in terms of weeds and maintenance uh, that way. Um, we like to cut back dormant stems in early spring to control height eventually. And all these plants come back very vigorously and to remove salt damaged stems. This year, we had a lot of salt damaged stems because of the late snowfall and the late salt. So, um, quick overview of the Tower Road bioswale, and we're going to see one other bioswale, which is um, the rice bowls. Call that because rice hall, rice hall parking lots uh, discharge into this area. Yeah, just as Nina's queuing up here, there were uh, three segments to uh, uh, redevelop parking lot here at Cornell. And there's no traditional storm drainage. They cross pitch into three basins. And at the time Cornell built these, they put turf in them, lawn, and staff hated it, hated it. Because they had side slopes like this, and they were, uh, intending to mow them. Um, so maintenance was a problem. So after a year or two, uh, we took this on as a class project, <clears throat> both to remediate the soil as well as to plant these. 
And as you'll see, we really just can't reinforce enough that we need to plant for canopy closure. This whole idea that plants are objects, you know, it's plants in space. I need to walk around, every one of them. Um, it's okay that they touch. And the idea is that after a year or two of mulching and maintaining, that they're relatively self-maintaining. Right, so we're going to see a little video of, oh. uh, for three and a half minutes or so of the rice bowls. More volunteers. How, how we, this was a three deep bowls, which where rice hall parking lot discharged into. It was all turf uh, initially, very compacted. Grounds folks hated to mow it because it was very steep and it was very difficult. There was a, a sand trench running through the bottom of each of these um, uh, bowls. And so, but we needed to make the soil appropriate for plants. Plants, we just couldn't, it was so compact that we couldn't get plants in. So we use a, uh, a technique called scoop and dump, where we add like six inches of compost, and then with a backhoe, go down and take that uh, mixed soil up and dump it. And that's to just show you how we did it. So it's amending in situ. volunteers so this is uh, we're taking compost and spreading it about six inches thick in the deep bile swells what you see here but you don't need to have 40 students to do this it can be done by a machine and of course then it poured then it poured <laughs> but we don't let them go away just letting you know if it's pouring outside right now. We, we don't. <laughs> so this is, you see the flags to prevent getting into the root zone of the tree. But we go down with a backhoe, scoop and dump right in place. So this compacted soil is kind of having veins of compost through it, not uniformly mixed. We get this kind of veins of compost and also increases infiltration. We've done research on this over 12 years showing that by doing this, we actually get better results over time. How long did the excavators spend in the hole? Uh -huh. It was probably an hour. No, no. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. One hour. Yeah. For, yeah. Uh, it's really cool. Maybe two hours. So notice it's pretty rough. rough. We don't rototill it. We want to keep it in this kind of a state where we have veins of infiltration and compost and compacted soil. We plant right into that, and then we're going to mulch on top of that. So it'll look perfectly wonderful, but uh, we won't have messed around with the soil more than we had to. As you can believe, see, we believe in having our students be physically physical. Right. Well, like hands on, nothing. No body strength. Yeah, nothing. So this is what this is. Uh, spring of four, 2014, right after, right after it was planted, it was May 2014. And we, there's one of the long three bioswales here. Four months later, it's now September, and it, things are starting to grow Biomass. in a big way. Uh, this is a rice parking lot, and there are infiltration zones into this one, two, three. Sheets across, you can see in the corner, uh, the curb is missing. It just cross pitches directly into you. So we're going to so that's where it comes in, into a gravel area, and then moves 14 months later, the next spring. Things are starting to really grow. I can't stress enough how important soil. Soil, soil, soil. Soil preparation, soil, soil. you know, soil makeup. The pre preparation is, is key to having these things work. And also plant selection. Plant selection is key, but without soil, all the plant selection in the world goes down the tubes. <coughs> so this was a couple of summers ago. It's there really- are, There are a few subshrub perennials. It's not like there's none. But most of these are woody plants. And very unusual group of plants. Some are, very, again, wet tolerant. 
and drought tolerant, especially on the bottoms of the swales, where we really will get more water. On the sides, you can get away with uh, less wet tolerant plants. We do have a few grasses, only because when the uh, plow guy sort of was putting snow in these basins, uh, he scraped the soil it's and scraped, scraped the plants. Scraped the edge in the basin. Take yeah. the plants. Okay. So we're going to try show you another infiltration practice, which um, has now been going on for 15 years. This was a uh, proposed parking lot area near the inlet at uh, downtown Ithaca, and the, there's a trail here, and the city wanted to have a, you know, it was a parking area, it's a trailhead parking area that was um, much better functioning instead of this sort of muddy area. And so uh, we were working on something uh, called structural soil, which is a gravel soil mix, which is very highly infiltrating. And I said, well, let's try porous asphalt and impervious asphalt and look at structural soil and planting trees in here to see how this works. And it's now 15 years of uh, this practice. So structural soil, we took off all that uh, top of the existing parking lot. We went down 24 inches with structural soil, which is a mixture of stone and soil, very highly in infiltration, very fast infiltration, even when compacted. So structural soil, the essence of it is that you compact it, it holds up pavement, sidewalks, it can be compacted to 95% proctor with no problem of plants roots getting through it. So it's a combination of you know, load bearing and root infiltration. So that's what you're seeing here. And that's what's kind of a graphic of it. You've got crushed stone, about one inch, and in between the pores that are created with the crushed stone of one size, we put soil in that, and the soil, because the stone is touching stone is touching stone, that's where the compactive effort comes, and the soil in those pores is not compacted. So roots can just shoot through that, and yet it still is a kind of lattice work of load bearing. Do you understand? Get that? Yeah, that's a concept. Okay, so in structural soils, uh, if we can, Compact it to, you know, the mean porosity is 26%. Soil alone is 34%. Lots of tiny little pores. Uh, compacted to proctor density, high density. The macro pores, the pores that allow water to infiltrate, however, are very different. In soil alone, we have got 2% of the soil alone Nothing. after it's compacted, which has macro pores, which allows it to drain. Whereas in structural soils, 31% of that after compaction is allowing water to drain through. So our infiltration rate is 24 inches an hour and less than a half inch in just soil. So realize that if you're putting a pervious situation, a pervious pavement over soil without having uh, something that's gonna allow rapid infiltration, you'll not get any infiltration. And then it fails and then people say, see, porous pavement doesn't work. work. So this is what we did. Uh, we have, uh, here's our pervious asphalt and this is our porous asphalt here right next to each other. That's what it looks like. So you have to get over the aesthetic of porous asphalt. Doesn't bother me. Um, and then we saw cut into it and planted uh, right into structural soil. There's more volunteers. Yeah, more volunteers. That's what it looks like under Pavement, compacted. And it's, uh, so, you know, was it 2006? I didn't design those barriers. Those I barriers. did. I so said- You can see they're protected. I mean, these little, trees. these are one and a half inch caliper trees. You see the snow plow coming? Those trees would have been in the next county. So, yeah, so I yellow. was protecting my trees. Okay, so a few years later, Doing pretty well. And so far, so good. Porous and non porous. And this was uh, 2016 from the other side of the inlet. Okay. Okay. Look back across. And so they've now meshed, their canopies are meshed. They're actually utilizing all that space. And what we see now, and I still have that, uh, is that, well, is that the ones in the porous asphalt are slightly bigger than those in the impervious. 
makes sense because you're getting any kind of water is going right through the porous asphalt into the structural soil, whereas in the non, in the impervious asphalt, water has to get into that little three foot saw cut area before it's going to get into the root zone. Structural soil uh, around here is made with crushed limestone, so the pH is high. So you need to you choose look plants. At plants. There are plenty of plants that can tolerate this. This happens to be elms. elms. Yeah. And so we then wanted to look at the roots, but the city of Ithaca didn't like you to dig up everything. So we used ground penetrating radar to visualize the roots and the root density under the structural soil, under the pavement. And this is Gary Raffel from Dynamic Tree Systems. And we worked together for many years looking at roots underground. And then this was six years ago. Yeah. So I want to show you a kind of a color rendering of root density. So here's trees three and four were plan view. And these stripes basically are passes with a ground penetrating radar. And the color, the hotter the color, is the density, the hotter the color, uh, the more roots in that space. Okay? The cooler the color, uh, there's no roots or very few roots. So you can see there's you know, more roots here next to the trees, but there's a lot of places where it's pretty cool, not a lot of roots. So remember this, because I'm going to show you, this is roots under impervious asphalt in structural soil. So I'm going to show you what roots look like in pervious asphalt, same with structural soil. <laughs> so the root mass, the root density is much, much greater in structural soil with pervious asphalt. So even if the trees weren't growing well, you're getting a lot of stormwater recharge. This is 24 inches of structural soil. Not, no need for a gravel base because it is basically as open as a base. So it has 31% porosity and pretty well similar to just, as, uh, just aggregate. And so uh, we would get six inches of rainfall uh, held under the pavement here and then allowed to go back into the groundwater. And the other message is that roots do penetrate structural soil. They're not contained in the good horticultural soil, which is the white space. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So it's interesting. This one actually leads. What's the blue line in the next slide? There's like, is that the sidewalk? Well, the blue line is in the next slide. Yeah, there's like this like all barrier. That, all that blue. That becomes, that's an area where there's no more structural soil. So that's the regular marking. That could be yeah. the, the yeah. street. Right. So right. Like well, the, the structural soil was put in an area and then that was yeah. it. And then they went back to regular. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's the street. This, the grouping in the, the, in the porous lot is, is a lot more, seems a lot more even and dense than in the yeah. Yeah. other bird, which is more scattered. Well, the problem, the issue is water. So, you know, structural soil is very well drained, and how do you get the water in? I mean, there's no way, it's, you know, structural soil is great, but you still have to get the water in to the ground. And that's where porous asphalt or porous paving makes a huge difference. Oh, and I'm just going to end with this, uh, which is our newest part of our sustainability trail, which is a totally porous asphalt parking lot, uh, which we're going to be planting a week from Thursday. Our class is planting this and this, and this is all porous. And under is an apron around the planting area of like eight or 10 feet of structural soil. So that the ability for roots to get out of this planting area, this is regular soil in here, and explore more volume. That was the whole area, while allowing for load bearing of that pavement. So Cornell got a big grant to do this, and the inspiration for the grant, the design was done in part by Valentina, right here, put your hand up. <laughs> um, did all the graphics that assisted Cornell in getting state funding. There's a green infrastructure grant program, New York State, if you have a green infrastructure pro uh, project, you can apply for this. And uh, as long as you document everything and keep water on site, it's mostly about stormwater, you can get funds to do these built projects, which is what Cornell did.
So, any questions that we are, we're going to go outside and see some of these things. Uh, so, what? Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, are there businesses that do permeable paving around here? People that do permeable paving? Yeah, like sure. Sure. We, I think our office, Andy, you can speak to that too. I mean, it's not at all unusual to do porous asphalt. Yeah, or, or, or permeable enough. paving pavers too as well. well. I was thinking about like the type that they poured on, like a organic, and I think what you're talking about here. I mean, it's not no, there's concrete. there's porous concrete, which is different than porous asphalt. So porous asphalt is fairly common. Um, porous concrete. Um, Twenty years ago, we needed an eighty car parking lot at the hospital. Which is still work. People say, well, you have to clean out porous asphalt. Porous asphalt. Porous asphalt. Porous concrete has evolved. And early on, I think it was Wasn't you know, very good. less perfected, a lot of spalling. Yeah. Um, but um, there is a scalable issue. I mean, you can't, it's hard to do two parking spots. But with porous asphalt, people say, well, don't you have to clean it out? Uh, even if you at the hospital, we haven't done it. Yeah, in the city of Ithaca There's doesn't do so anything. Much, it's such an incredible rate of infiltration. Even if you lose 50%, you're still going to have very fast oh. infiltration. So some debris, some dust gets in there. What you don't want to do is have anybody sand yeah, the parking lot as, as for snow. Salt is fine. It's going to dissolve. It's going to go through. But sand will clog up the pores. And that's or what get, you don't want. During construction to get... Right, soil, soil right. that's the biggest killer right we don't want to clog up the pores uh so that uh we'll, so again we've had many uh, the hospital downtown ithaca the yeah, parking yeah, lot yeah. and this new parking lot which we just built and we'll be planting next week uh is all porous and strangely enough i think this is the first major porous asphalt area for cornell which you'd think they'd be a leader on the pack. <laughs> but just realized there are some other porous pavement, resin based pavements, very expensive porous. But uh, I've seen the spec for this, it calls for six inches of gravel or aggregate under that. That's much too little. Okay. If you get gravel of six inches and with a porous surface, when it gets to the point where you hit the compacted soil, that just water is going to just go up or move if there's any uh, slope to that. So you need. A reasonable reservoir of aggregate to hold the storm water. So there's one other thing. Yes, question. Um, in the rice bowl example, um, as the canopy closure occurs, does the need for mulching and mowing go away? Yeah, mostly. There's uh, no mowing, okay? Yeah, there's, there's no grass there. Right. But we mulch for the first few years. Until we get canopy closure. So and then, then the leaves create yeah, the mulch. Yeah. I mean, we sometimes, you know, if there's a little bit just for aesthetics or wa more water holding, we might mulch. Or an edge condition. Edge condition. Edges are always difficult. You can't get canopy right to the edge. Um, but we, uh, we tip, you know, adding organic. See, we put a lot of organic in when we do this scoop and dump. Uh, and so that will decompose and that will be eaten by our microorganisms over time. And we'll have subsidence. But we found through our research that if we add mulch every year until we get plants creating their own mulch, we won't lose organic matter. Yeah. Uh, I'm on the residential installation side of uh, landscaping, and, and um, generally speaking, customers I'm in the uh, Washington, D.C. area, so they're very aware, and they have disposable income typically that they understand it, and they're willing or interested in doing uh, permeable driveways and things along this. But cost is generally a big issue in the comparison between traditional paving services and, oh, and sure. the additional preparation. I assume on the asphalt and concrete side, the cost is also a stomach block. So well, it's partly with porous asphalt. It's not so much the asphalt itself, but because we're excavating 24 inches versus 8 inches. There's both excavation and base course material, which really adds up. Would be municipal regulation ultimately that would drive this because the consumer's not driving it. 
Yeah, someone's got to decide that uh, runoff is a critical issue. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one other thing we wanted, before I forget, we provided a handout over here. You can go online. All of these things are online. The videos, booklets about the plants and so on. So there's a little handout that will get you in. Yeah, we have a big website, which all this information is there for free. Uh, please take it and uh, utilize it. Go look around. There's lots of things to see on that website. Um, yeah, the other thing, I, one thing we also have noticed with the porous uh, asphalt is that you have to have a big enough job because the asphalt plants have to clean out a bay to put this new mix in. And if it's too small, it's a cost to them. So a bigger project would be more cost effective. You know, so contractors are getting used to doing it. You know, 15 years ago, it was a mystery. And it's becoming second nature. Are they make it for us? Well, they don't put fines in it. Most asphalt, as you saw from that picture, the porous looked, you know, really... Smooth. Oh, not, not smooth, yeah. The, Porous looked really chunky. Mm -hmm. So normally in asphalt, you get a big range of sand particles, small to larger, like uh, number ones, twos. Uh, if you just use number twos and stick them together like caramel corn, then you get a lot of infiltration. Because you have just holding it yeah, it's just holding it together. It's the tumens which hold it together, yeah. There's an air space. Because there's no few fines in the mix. I know I'm we're generalizing all these things, but yeah. good enough. For question the back. audience. Question the back. Yes. Some of us are here from uh, watershed regions, really focusing on the harmful algal blooms and trying to find ways to mitigate our stormwater runoff in different ways. Mm -hmm. Being one that's helpful. Um, how is the state responding to this kind of mitigation when looking at you know, $65 million that have been put into um, harmful algal blooms to the government? Well, ultimately, DEC determines acceptable practice. And they do uh, now accept... Uh, well, there were infiltration. I mean, it keeps changing, right, Andy? You know, what the state requires or allows for in terms of practices. So you need to keep up to date with DEC acceptable practice. Question yeah. I think this is kind of checking off of that question, but I'm curious that grant for the proposal that is up here, was this, um, did you include carbon algal bloom prevention as a part of? No, no, this was done a long time ago. No, okay. no, and, and it's, you know, um, I think you need to decide, you know, where the nearest water bodies are. And, you know, I, I'm not sure. You know, many of these things are not the silver bullet. They're a part of a bigger set of practices. You're not going to find a practice that solves for all the things that people are looking for. So if you're getting a lot of organic runoff that's just feeding the algal blooms, you need to find out where that is. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes it's agriculture, sometimes it's homeowners that fertilize gratuitously, because Scott's told me to. Mm -hmm. I need to put it down in the spring. I need to put it down in the fall. And at rates, you wouldn't believe. So, I mean, that's, you know, that's when you have exceptional organic runoff is when you get the algal blooms. And if we can get that, you know, all that runoff in the ground, it would be, it would reduce that problem, but it's, it's a bigger problem than just one parking lot. Well, yes. Yes. Have you guys ever introduced irrigation to a bioswale? Uh, you know, it's like you're irrigating a green roof. You know, at some point, you sort of wonder, why would we do that? Um, well, we do, I, we do it to establish the plants. And well, then that's it. But not permanent irrigation. No, no. It would just be initial 
maybe one year in a dry spell while the plants are getting their roots in the ground. Uh, after that, period. after that, choice of plants should be, and the choice of soil should be able to handle that. We don't irrigate, period. I mean, otherwise it's sort of counterintuitive in terms of what we're trying to right. accomplish. Again, choosing wet and dry tolerant plants. Once they're established, it's not initial. Once you plant, again, they're still in their pots or whatever, and their roots haven't really explored that soil. Once they've had a year or so to do that, then they really take off in terms of their ability. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.